This podcast may contain descriptions of violence, drug use, murder, sexual assault, and criminal behavior in general. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, I'm Mike and welcome to Colliginous. For our very first full episode, we're going to be discussing Gilbert Paul Jordan, who would later be known as the Boozing Barber. Gilbert's birth name was Gilbert Paul Elsey, and he was born on December 12th, 1931. It wouldn't be until 1965 that he would change his name to Gilbert Paul Jordan, but we'll get to that soon. By all accounts, Gilbert grew up in a normal household. He was a second son, and his father, Jack Elsey, had worked as a street railway man, conductor, bus driver, and later as a banker at the Royal Bank. Jordan's mother, Winifred, worked as a sales clerk and was described as being a strong-willed woman. Jordan's brother Bud once said that he was, quote, unaware of any trauma or abuse having taken place in Jordan's early life. However, Jordan's parents' marriage didn't last long. They separated when Jordan and Bud were fairly young, and the boys continued to live with their father. Their father, Jack, would later remarry a nurse by the name of Phyllis, and they would go on to have a son named Robert, who would move away to live in Europe once he was an adult. Jordan's mother, Winifred, remained active in her son's lives. She would buy them new clothes and visit with them as often as she was able. She too would remarry in 1946 to a naval officer by the name of Lloyd. Both of Jordan's brothers would go on to live normal lives. Neither one had a criminal record. Bud would later remark to a reporter that, quote, the guy's a mystery to me. He always has been, even when we were kids, end quote. In school, Jordan was described as shy and withdrawn. His nickname had been Chubb because of his short and stocky build. Jordan had a hard time making friends in school, and that trend continued into his teenage years. Jordan himself admitted this when he once said, quote, sober people wouldn't go out with me, so I was left without any other option. I didn't want to drink in my room all by myself. Unfortunately, Jordan's early years remained very much a mystery. No one really fully understands what drove Jordan to commit so many crimes during his life, but his nickname may give us a small insight into what drove this terrifying man to kill. Jordan dropped out of Kitsilano Secondary School in the 8th grade. It's unclear when Jordan's drinking began, but it's thought to be shortly after he dropped out of school. He once bragged about being drunk when he was 16, and by 18 he was most certainly drinking heavily on a consistent basis. This is also when his criminal career would begin in earnest. By the age of 18, Jordan was given a one-year sentence for stealing a car. He quickly amassed a large rap sheet which included charges such as heroin possession, indecent assault, hit and run, and drunk driving. He also realized he enjoyed drunken sex. He gained a reputation as being the town drunk, and it's said that he slept with hundreds of women in Vancouver's downtown east side, which was thought of at the time as Vancouver's skid row. He would ply women, mostly down on their luck indigenous women, with drugs and alcohol, sometimes offering them money to accompany him to a hotel room where he could safely ply them with drugs and alcohol, with the goal of sleeping with them once they were both drunk. In 1961, when Jordan was 30 years old, He was arrested by the RCMP for kidnapping. An RCMP officer had somehow seen Jordan in a gravel pit with a five-year-old indigenous girl in the backseat of his car. Jordan had taken the child from a reserve, and by the time he was found by the RCMP, they were quite away from the child's place of residence. It's unknown what Jordan had done with the child before he was caught, but he would never face justice because there was a stay of proceedings, meaning that, for some reason, the Crown or Court decided to postpone the proceedings indefinitely. Later that same year, Jordan, who was extremely intoxicated, threatened to jump from the Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver. His lawyer, H.A.D. Oliver, talked him down from the bridge. Jordan was also having issues with his relationship with his mom, who he was supposedly closer to than his father. His mother, Mildred, was a devout Methodist and disapproved of her son's drinking and criminal activity. If he tried to contact her while drunk, she would hang up on him. She also wouldn't allow him to drink even a drop of alcohol in her home. However, this didn't prevent Gilbert from continuing to drink. It's said that he was drinking 50 ounces of straight vodka on a daily basis, which is one hell of a lot of alcohol. In essence, that's 50 shots of vodka per day. On March 3rd, 1962, Jordan picked up two women from the downtown east side, 
He drove them out to Cole Harbor, and they all began to consume vodka. One of the women said she wasn't feeling good, and got out of the car to get some air. Jordan, seeing his chance, drove away with the other woman, and allegedly raped her. On April 6, 1962, Jordan was in court for the rape charge, as well as two counts of theft. He gave the presiding judge, Judge Poole, a Nazi salute, yelling, Heil Poole, Heil Neil, Heil Puppeteers. Jordan was found in contempt of court and sentenced to six months in jail. Even after all of this, Jordan was acquitted of the rape charge. He would be sentenced to two years in prison for the theft charges, but Jordan would later appeal this ruling and win. Once again, Jordan was a free man. It seemed that no matter what he did, how many charges he racked up, the criminal justice system would do nothing substantive to stop him. While I was researching for this podcast, I asked myself over and over, how did Jordan pay for all of this? Alcohol isn't cheap. Lawyers aren't cheap. He often paid for prostitutes, and he never seemed to want for money. It wasn't until I read Harriet Fox's book, Alcohol Murders, that I found my answer. Apparently, he worked at a variety of jobs, including an auto wrecking yard, lumber yard, and at the tugs. While he continued to drink copious amounts of alcohol, he was said to be a hard worker, even though he would occasionally not show up for work. Later in his life, he would discover investment banking, likely because of his father's job at the bank. He had a knack for it and would eventually become quite wealthy. In 1965, someone would die in Jordan's company. Before we begin this next part, it's important that we understand blood alcohol levels and what impact they have on the human body. At 0.04 to 0.06 blood alcohol levels, you start to feel relaxed. This is what most people think of as the pleasant stage of inebriation, in which you suffer mild impairment to your judgment. But most people find this sensation pleasing. At 0.08, most people start experiencing a slight blurring of the vision. They may slur a little bit, and it's not legal to drive in this condition. At 0.13 to 0.15, people often suffer severe blurred vision, gross impairment of motor control, and a major loss of judgment. 0.25 to 0.30, you would need assistance walking. You'd feel nauseous and would likely begin vomiting. This is the threshold often thought of as severe intoxication. 0.35 to 0.40, this is the stage most people would lose consciousness. You're also in danger of slipping into a coma or dying. 0.40 and up is when you're in severe danger of dying due to respiratory failure. Ivy Rose Oswald was Jordan's first victim. On January 17th, 1965, Jordan was accompanied by Ivy, a switchboard operator, to a cheap motel. The next day, her dead, naked body would be found in the room. An autopsy revealed that her blood alcohol level was 0.51. Now, remember that death from acute alcohol poisoning usually occurs within the 0.35 and 0.40 ranges. This meant that Ivy was over that limit by a considerable amount. But because no one had ever heard of someone using alcohol as a murder weapon, her death was ruled an accident, even though Jordan had some of her belongings in his possession after Ivy's death. 22 years later, Jordan admitted to murdering Ivy, but was never formally charged with her murder. Remember I said at the beginning of this episode that Jordan would change his name from Gilbert Paul LZ to Gilbert Paul Jordan? Well, it was four days after Ivy was found dead in that hotel room that he applied for the name change. I haven't been able to figure out why exactly, some people think it's because his alcoholism and criminal activity was a constant embarrassment to his family, and so he changed his last name so it would be harder for people to connect his activity with his family. Others think he was trying to shed the murderous persona he was taking on, and others think it might be something as simple as him not liking his last name. Whatever the case, he eventually obtained a legal name change. He also continued to rack up criminal charges. In 1969, he was arrested twice in one day for drunk driving. In 1971, Jordan was charged with lewd acts in a public place, but the charges would be dismissed. Once again, the criminal justice system refused to act on Jordan's criminal activity, and he was allowed to continue his crime spree. In 1972, Jordan married Renona Mary. As you can imagine, life with Jordan was no picnic. It was alleged that Jordan was often physically and verbally abusive, and of course he continued to drink daily. The marriage lasted three years before they separated. Their divorce was finalized in 1983. In 1973, Jordan was charged with indecent exposure. But, as you can probably guess by now, since it's a recurring theme, the charges would be later dropped. 
1974, he was sentenced to two years for indecent sexual assault. Surely at this point, after having kidnapped a young indigenous girl, being accused of rape and sexual assault, and convicted of a slew of other crimes, the criminal justice system would take action. Right? For the Crown's part, they did try. The Crown attempted to have Jordan declared a dangerous sexual offender, but his lawyer convinced the court that wasn't necessary. After just one year, Jordan was released on parole. In 1975, Jordan once again kidnapped someone, this time a female patient from a mental institution. He raped her. The prosecutor in that case described Jordan as, quote, the scariest man I ever met. You think that this time, surely this time, the courts would put Jordan away for a very long time. But once again, they used kid gloves on him, and he was only sentenced to 26 months for this heinous crime. As a result, several more women would lose their lives. The year is 1976, and a judge orders that a psychiatrist, Dr. Bezzaretti, interview Jordan. The doctor would diagnose Jordan with antisocial personality disorder, which he defined as, quote, a person whose conduct is maladjusted in terms of social behavior, disregard for the rights of others, which often results in unlawful activities, end quote. And I think we can see this in his behavior up until now, not just with his crimes, but the way he treated the court when he gave a Nazi salute to the judge, and how little regard he had for the rule of law, although the law up until this point had certainly done very little to punish Jordan for any of his numerous crimes, some of which led to life-changing, damaging loss to Jordan's victims. You may also be wondering what Jordan looked like at this point. There aren't very many photos of the man, but a middle-aged Jordan looks fairly unremarkable. He had a neatly trimmed graying mustache, which was accompanied by the grizzled stubble on his chin. He wore large, aviator-type glasses, and was balding on top. The hair on the sides of his head was kept short and neat. In one of the pictures, his mouth is pulled back into a rictus of a grin, but the attempted smile never reaches his eyes. They seemed to me to be dark and unfeeling. While Jordan was serving his time, he learned how to barber. Once he was released, he set up his own barber shop near the downtown east side, with its many bars and desperate people. This would become his new base of operations, which he would use to essentially hunt women. Jordan would host drinking parties at his shop, and he quickly gained the nickname of the Boozing Barber. Jordan brought women to his shop, and once they were too inebriated to object, he would steal their valuables. Sometimes he would sell them in the front window of his barber shop. I just want to pause for a moment to say that I hate this next part of the story. I mean, I'm left with a bunch of names, dates of death, and blood alcohol numbers, but I know very little about the victims themselves. In fact, despite Jordan's numerous crimes, he seems to have perpetrated one more crime on his victims. He robbed them of their voice. On December 15th, 1984, Patricia Thomas was found dead at the barber shop with a blood alcohol level of 0.51. On June 28th, 1985, Patricia Andrew would also be found dead with a blood alcohol level of 0.79, which is an astronomical amount of alcohol. Jordan would even call 911 and report the deaths. But despite his lengthy criminal record and the mounting deaths of women who were last seen in his company, Jordan would never be charged with these murders. The authorities labeled them accidental deaths and their families would never receive any justice. Many people believe that the police were negligent because the victims were often female indigenous prostitutes with a history of substance abuse. In their eyes, they were expendable, but they were human and deserved better from the very people whose job it is to supposedly serve and protect them and the rest of society from monsters like Jordan. On October 11th, 1987, Jordan picked up a 27-year-old woman by the name of Vanessa Lee Buckner. They went back to a hotel room and continued to drink heavily. I've read and seen conflicting accounts of what happened next, but one thing that's consistent is that she would be found naked and dead in that hotel room with a blood alcohol level of 0.91, which is more than twice the amount of alcohol needed to kill someone. Jordan would leave the room at approximately 6 a.m. on October 12th. At approximately 7.40 a.m., Jordan would anonymously call the Vancouver Police Department and report Vanessa's death. Although Jordan would call anonymously, the operator managed to keep him on the line long enough to trace the call back to another hotel room that Jordan had been staying at for over a year. As an aside, I've also seen reports that the number was traced back to his barber shop. In either case, the police were able to track him down and question him. Anyway, after the police discovered Vanessa's body, they tracked down Jordan for questioning. 
Once again, Jordan was not charged. But the police did find his story to be suspicious. And although the autopsy would find that Vanessa died of acute alcohol poisoning, detectives also noticed bruising on her upper arms. As for the conflicting accounts, I've seen it reported that Vanessa still had custody of her baby and had dropped her child off at her mother's before going out on the evening of October 11th. In another account, it says that she had lost custody of her child. But in either case, Vanessa was a mother, and when police found Vanessa's mother, she insisted that her daughter drank very rarely. Vanessa's mother put together a long list of people who she said would confirm her story, and once police questioned those people, they were forced to admit that Vanessa didn't seem to be an avid drinker certainly not someone who was capable of consuming that much alcohol before dying. This wasn't enough evidence to formally charge Jordan, but the police put him under surveillance. They set up a shop in a room adjoined to Jordan's and began to listen in on his drinking parties. They also followed him to bars and hotels where he tried to find indigenous women. The police surveilled Jordan for six weeks. In that time, they intervened four times, possibly saving the lives of four more women. The police also heard him telling various women things like, Quote, have a drink. Down the hatch, baby. Twenty bucks if you drink it right down. See if you're a real woman. Finish that drink. Finish that drink. Down the hatch. Hurry. Right down. You need another drink? I'll give you fifty bucks if you can take it. End quote. On the last intervention, police found Jordan on top of a nearly unconscious woman. He was holding her on the upper arm and pouring vodka down her throat. He was arrested and charged with the first-degree murder of Vanessa Lee Buckner. Jordan went on trial in 1988. He admitted to giving Vanessa too much alcohol, although he denied it was negligence on his part. He also said that she had been alive when he left the hotel room that morning. He recounted how he had watched black liquid leak out of Vanessa's nose and mouth before he'd left. The presiding judge said that Jordan was, quote, a predator who used alcohol as a deadly instrument of choice. However, his charges were reduced to manslaughter because the court didn't think they could prove intent beyond a reasonable doubt. He was sentenced to 15 years in jail. He later had his sentence reduced to nine years, but he would be released after serving only six years. Justice Sam Toya wrote this, quote, Although the appellate has left a trail of seven victims, the last was the first occasion when a person in authority, in a forceful and realistic manner, brought to the appellate's attention that the fact that supplying substantial quantities of liquor to women who were prepared to drink with him was a contributing cause of their deaths for which he might be held criminally responsible, end quote. In other words, the court excused Jordan's role in the deaths of those women. The same judge would go on to write this in 1991, quote, Having now been incarcerated for three years, the appellant should, or ought by now to know, that he must rigidly control his alcoholism. There is some indication that he may be able to do so. In short, I am not convinced, as the sentencing judge was, that the appellant's antisocial personality is incurable. End quote. The justice system had failed one more time. Based on this opinion, Jordan was released from prison in 1994. Jordan was placed on probation. In short, he was not to leave Vancouver Island. He was to stay out of a red zone that included bars and hotels. And he was not to be in the company of women anywhere alcohol was being served. After listening to the entire podcast so far, I bet you can guess what Jordan did. That's right. He broke his probation terms over and over and over. Jordan would spend the rest of his days breaching his probation, committing crimes and bouncing in and out of prison. He attempted to change his last name to Pierce, but failed. He was found entering and drinking in the red zone numerous times. In 2000, he was interviewed by a newspaper reporter working for the Vancouver Sun. Jordan said this about the women who had been found dead in his company. Quote, I didn't give a damn who I was drinking with. I mean, we're all dying sooner or later, whether it's in this bar, across the street, or wherever. End quote. In 2004, Jordan was caught plying a woman with alcohol in a Saskatchewan hotel, once again in breach of his probation. The woman he had been drinking with was hospitalized, but survived. He would be acquitted of those charges because of a lack of evidence. Jordan died of natural causes on July 7, 2006, at the age of 74. He never showed any remorse for murdering those women or for the numerous other crimes he had committed. That ends our first episode. I hope you enjoyed it. We're a brand new podcast, so any support is greatly appreciated. Please follow, 
like, and review this podcast wherever you may be listening to it. That all by itself is a great help as we try to get the word out. If you would like to support us financially, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash podcast. You can also find the link in the show notes. You might even get to be the first ever patron of the show. You will also be able to find links to the research I did in order to make this episode in the show notes. However, the most important piece of the puzzle, and where I took a lot of the information presented in this episode, can be found in the book Alcohol Murders, True Story of Serial Killer Gilbert Paul Jordan by the author Harriet Fox. Another really important contribution was found in a late 90s true crime show called Exhibit A. The episode was called Dead Drunk. Finally, if you'd like a specific case to be featured on the show, or would like to offer any criticism, advice, or just a comment on the show, you can find our email address in the show notes. Thanks again, and I hope to have another episode out shortly.